By episode 6 of the new season of Stranger Things, our characters are scattered all over the place. That's a lot of stories happening simultaneously. As a viewer, it could be easy to lose focus when we cut to our many different locations. But instead, Stranger Things expertly juggles multiple plot lines, keeps moving the story forward, and never lets its foot off the gas. I studied episode 6, The Dive, and here are all of the ways the show grabs your attention and doesn't let go. The first and flashiest method is to use transitional cuts that draw attention to themselves. These are pretty stylistic choices, but they don't mess around. At the start of the episode, Jason recovers from the lake incident, providing info for the officers. With a flash of a bright light outside, we transition to a search boat on the water. So cool. Seeing this light inside indicates to me that we're about to move outside, that there's a search going on, while also giving kind of an extraterrestrial feel. Well, shortly after, one of my most favorite cuts in the episode. Brenna is explaining to Eleven how she can get her powers back. With a tap on her nose, we immediately move to him using a keypad. So what does this mean? Perhaps Brenna simply sees Eleven as a tool, some equipment that he can use that will give him access to something else, like the keypad on the door. All he needs to do is press the right buttons. That's an expert way of moving the scene forward while focusing on the story. This type of cut is called a match cut and drives your story forward while linking both scenes. But those examples stay with the same character or location. We've got many more scenes to link up. How do we possibly move across this mess while not getting dizzy? Well, every decision you make when moving from one scene to another has significance. The first way is nothing fancy. Use a standard cut and let the context of the previous scene do the talking. This shot of Eleven on its own has something to say, but wait for what came just before. <laughs> This officer is being tortured for protecting Eleven's whereabouts. I will know. By cutting from his pained screams in the cage to Eleven's own confinement, I recognized how many distant lives this little girl has affected. The fact that his yell echoes into Eleven's scene suggests in some impossible way that she can hear it herself. Maybe another instance of Eleven being seen as a tool comes here when we cut back to Hawkins. Or it's a way of moving from emotional impact to a literal impact. Or, after Joyce and Murray crash the plane, they brainstorm how they can break Jim out of KGB prison. It's the driving force of the whole scene, learning which way they should find their friend. Where's the prison? And which shot follows immediately next? Maybe it's on the nose, but by showing us a prison door being unlocked, we feel we're stepping in the right direction. Another creative method is to use motion to link scenes. Like in the meal scene, when Jim lowers his drink and we cut to Eleven's toy falling. We know that Jim misses her, and since they share the same motion, it suggests that they're still in harmony. Or later, when Eleven floats in the Nina tank, and the movement of the camera motivates the next shot over Hawkins' woods. Eleven misses her friends, and she wants to be with them. In this fluid movement, we're being told that maybe they're not so far away. But the common sense method for juggling multiple storylines like this is just to move the audience in the direction we want to go. Every scene should have a goal. Find Skull Rock, locate the prison, use a computer. It makes sense for these goals to just move in the same direction. Of course, we don't want to step backwards. The kids in Hawkins reunite with Eddie by Skull Rock. Jesus, we thought you were a goner. We feel happy, we feel safe, but we waste no time before. How long have you known that Eddie Munson was killing these kids? We're reminded of the stakes of the situation. This J cut to the Hawkins lady. How long have you known that Eddie Munson was killing these kids? Demanding Eddie's arrest while we're still basking in the friendly reunion snaps us back to reality while still pushing us forward. At the end of the scene, we sit on Mike's parents, and it's pretty obvious where we'll go after that. Back in Russia, Joyce and Murray now have a plan to gain access to the prison. We again cut to Jim to indicate how close these stories are to overlapping. This shot is really important to the whole season, but I'll cover that in a moment. When studying the episode, I also noticed that sometimes dialogue is all you need to move scenes. Maybe I'm reaching on this one, but Robin saying this. Bedtime at nine, kiddos. Immediately followed by 11 as a child, I don't know. It puts into perspective how young our main characters are. Or when Eddie asks the guys to find him and Dustin says this. Hold tight, we're coming, we're coming. And we cut to the other boys driving in Salt Lake City. They're far away, but they're trying to help in their own way too. But the best way for us to stay focused is if we know we're looking for something. Now this can be consciously or subconsciously. It's pretty obvious here when we're showing this floppy finger and then shortly after Steve gets dragged down. Sometimes it's literal in a very abstract sense. This puck lands in four, and right after, Eleven is surrounded by four bullies. But I love it when filmmakers plant seeds early. I didn't really digest all of this until my rewatch, 
But 18 minutes in, we're shown the KGB guard lighting his cigarette. It's shown for a while, but means nothing at the time. Half an hour later, we cut to this close-up of the guard lighting a cigarette again, this time with Hopper watching on. After a demotivating discussion on the Demogorgon and how doomed the men were, this is your last meal. Jim realizes he actually has one option, fire. You can almost see his brain calculating all of it. Of course, an episode later, Jim ends up surviving the Demogorgon's first attack by utilizing this fire, something that was hinted to us way, way back. But listen guys, there's one cut in this episode that stands above the rest. One editing decision that expertly uses location and character to tell the story. So, Eleven is being used as the subject in Project Nina, a machine that Dr. Brenner hopes will reignite Eleven's powers by forcing her to relive buried memories. Your abilities are still in here. Every moment inside this room is a flashback. We're watching Eleven spectate an old memory. We can see this clearly when she looks at her reflection and sees her younger self. As the traumatic memories begin to surface, we're focused on the older Eleven. And then this happens. So what's actually happened here? Here's the layout. If we're on this left side of the mirror first, looking at older Eleven, when she spins around, we're effectively moving all the way over here. Except what a second ago was baby Eleven is now the older version. We've moved through to the other side of the mirror into Eleven's true reality. She's no longer spectating the memory. She's truly reliving it. Also notice how her reflection isn't even there anymore. She's now become the child she saw in the mirror. Stranger Things really is one of those shows that definitely will improve with a rewatch. You might be surprised with what you pick up, I know I was. What should we talk about next? Like and subscribe.